Now we are going to turn to um, a Zoom conference with Dr. DeLauro. Um, Dr. DeLauro is an associate professor at the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership at the United States Air Force Academy. Unfortunately, he could not make it here today with us, but we are grateful to have him with us via Zoom. Um, and he's going to talk about the changing the culture of concussion self-reporting using data from his own research at the Air Force Academy. All right, thank you. So um, if you've ever organized one of these events, you know that at the very last minute, there is one person who causes 80% of your troubles. And sadly today, that is me. So I want to thank the organizers for doing a good job of accommodating me. I'm really glad to be able to share the information we've collected here at the Academy with you all. Um, as a short, um, so, so um, to kind of give a broader view, I'm trained as a face recognition neuroscientist and I came to the Academy, but I saw that there are lots of interesting opportunities to uh, research concussions. And in particular, I'm, um, I'm interested in this issue of how we change this culture re re relating to concussion and how we can use it to make actual clinical care better. And so if we talk about um, why, are we seeing everything? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if we talk about why clinicians should care about self-report studies, the, the typical thing you'll hear is 50% of concussions go unreported. It's been that's been found in a few different studies. And so we're leaving, leaving a lot of brains untreated. And that's true, and that's something we should care about. A thing that I focused on as sort of a newbie to the field is there is no silver bullet sort of concussion treatment. You can't give someone a blood test and decide if they have a concussion. And so once they're diagnosed, there's still this loophole where we have this symptom symptom um, symptoms worsening during exercise is what keeps them from progressing from stage to stage in the return to sport protocol and so to a degree that we don't always appreciate when we talk about clinical care all of concussion healthcare is reliant on honest self-report and if we have bias or underreporting, um, then then people are being returned before they're ready and so the way that we think of um, self-report here is that it's an ongoing process, not a one-time act, okay? And so we need to be thinking about this throughout the continuum of concussion care. So one thing that has created a lot of our opportunities here is that we're part of this NCAA and Department of Defense Grand Alliance. So this is the, um, the team we have here at the Academy. On the far left is Dr. Jerry McGinty and Dr. John Jackson. They are the local PIs for the CARE Concussion Consortium here. I'm an associate investigator on that protocol. And so there are two components of this CARE sort of, um, of this larger DOD and NCAA uh, approach to understanding concussions. The one that I'm principal investigator on is our local effort with the Mind Matters Grand Challenge. How do we change the culture around concussion? So that followed the CARE initiative and they interact here in a couple of important ways. And so one thing that's different, you can see all of the different organizational structure of care here. What I would draw your attention to is here at the NC, NC, uh, at USAFA, the Air Force Academy, we're both part of the CSC and ARC, as well as Mind Matters. And what this means is that because of the special DOD role in this, we started off by consenting all 4,000 cadets every summer to do the, to do the concussion baselines for care. Um, the picture here is one of the hallways at the Air Force Academy. And you can see two chairs facing each other with a best pad next to them. And this is just one of about five hallways that we would man during the summer in order to provide 4,000 concussion baselines during the summer. As an associate investigator who is a non-clinician, it was my job to basically consent about 2,000 cadets over the course of the summer. And, and as a non-PI, we also knew that despite all that volunteer time, we were not going to be getting on any publications. And so I thought, well, while we've already got this giant data collection machine set up, what else can we do that would be really interesting to study concussions. We came up with the idea of, of using a con concussion self-report survey. Okay, and so our, our goals with this were, one, we want to kind of look at all the work that's been done before and create a comprehensive survey. 
We also wanted to tailor our address, our, our work to address specific subpopulations at the academy. Um, there are some reasons to think that there are special subpopulations here that might be less willing to uh, self-report or more nervous about it. But then we also wanted to take this data and create effective interventions aimed at increasing this self-report. Um, ultimately, all of this is it's got to come back to the, the ultimate goal of making clinical outcomes better, right? We want to keep this integrated into clinical care. We don't want to think of self-reported of concussion as this separate little social science project. This matters for care. And so what we did was we took a lot of um, prior work and looked at the theoretical basis of culture baseline. We wanted to explore all possible feasible reasons for or against self-report in one framework. With our huge um, data collection setup, we had pretty good confidence that we would get the kind of numbers that would allow us the statistical power to, to test all of these different factors against each other. And so like other people, we've, we've based our work on the theory of planned behavior. We look at perceived cost, perceived rewards, attitude, identity, social report, and social norms. So which of these are going to best rep uh, predict self-report of concussion? And we created this um, single dependent measure that we call anticipated concussion disclosure on it. So it's a measure of behavioral intent. But um, one, of our, um, one of my co-authors here, Craig Foster, has created a bit of a unique scenario that we think captures some of this um, self-report intent uh, a little bit more precisely than maybe some other things had in the past. And so, so we had this scenario that we wrote at the top of this um, one page flyer that we gave to all cadets who were being baseline for a concussion, uh, for, for the concussion, the care concussion consortium. We said, imagine that you are confident that you suffered a concussion and you believe that you're experiencing concussion related symptoms. Despite these symptoms, you're confident that nobody knows about your concussion. Thus, if you kept this information to yourself, you're confident that nobody at the Air Force Academy would know about your concussion. How likely is it that you would report this to medical staff? And one is least likely and nine is most likely, okay? So the demographics of our, of our survey are interesting. Um, for one thing, we got 2,503 responses. So um, that's a lot of statistical power that lets us look at some of these subgroups. Also interesting to me, 1,700 of these were non-athletes. Okay, a lot of times we talk about athlete culture in regards to concussion, but so little work in concussions has been done outside of elite athletes. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to say that that's what's causing it. And so we, our hypotheses based on prior work were that Athletes would be less likely to self-report a concussion. Um, that's not very surprising. But also that future pilots would be less likely to self-report. And we will get into why we believe that in just a couple of slides. So when we looked at this theoretical basis and our factors and how that predicted uh, self-report of concussion, we used these six independent variables and we were able to predict about 60% of the variance associated with self-report of concussion. So, so based on these factors, perceived cost rewards, attitude identity, social support, social norms, 60% um, of the variance uh, essentially on, on this self-report measure. And if we look at the overall results, the first thing you wanna do is put this in context. Um, this is how many cadets have reported each of these different uh, responses to whether or not they would self-report a concussion. So overall, I want to keep this in context. The median is a seven. The modal response, the most common one is a nine. So that's pretty high self-response rate. That's pretty good likelihood to re uh, report. But what if we look at our subpopulations? What's interesting is that athletes are not surprisingly, with one blip in junior year here, a little bit less likely to self-report. They start, start off a little less likely. Um, but in senior year, when they're most likely to be starters, nearing the end of their NCAA career, that's when they show the least likelihood to self-report a concussion. But overall, they're still above the median reporting rate. Five would be fairly ambivalent, so they're a little bit better than that. What's more interesting to us is that pilots become much less likely to self-report over time. And so if we look at freshman year, pilots of, and non-pilots are equally likely to not report or sorry, equally likely to be 
highly enthusiastic about reporting. Uh, again, this is a self-report intent measure. So this is about how comfortable they would feel about self-reporting. And we can see that initially all cadets are about a seven and there's an acculturation process that goes on. So sophomore year, there's a drop in both groups, but our non-pilots have flattened out, whereas pilots continue this increasing likelihood to feel uncomfortable reporting a concussion. And in fact, for senior year, our pilots show um, that they are on the other side of the median. They are less likely to self-report a concussion. And, and why is that the case? Why would they not disclose? Well, for athletes, the number one factor that came up, not surprisingly, is about missing practice or game time. Um, so you can see that's highly significant here. For pilots, they are worried about missing airfield activities. And you can see, again, this is significant as well. There are other significant factors for pilots, things like worried about their future careers. And we'll get into why that is. So we consider this sort of our cultural baseline survey. Um, this is our overall summary. Athletes show some willingness, but pilots are really much more negative over time. And so that's where we concentrated our focus. And why? What we found is that the costs that they, they perceived were so high were the reasons that athletes and pilots did not want to report. For athletes, it's missing game time. And for pilots, it's, miss, it's, it's missing airfield activities. What's interesting is we had identity measures for both of these. Being an athlete is important to my identity. Being a military professional or a pilot is important to my identity. Neither of these were significant in predicting this self-report intent. It was not about their identity. It was about their fear of missing out on that opportunity. And so the next summer, we plan on exploring these beliefs, some of them which are false beliefs, and how they shape self-report. So for uh, the next summer, we put together what we call a myth survey. We wanted to explore cadets' knowledge and beliefs about concussions. We had the same dependent measure, that concussion scenario, but this time we put symptom knowledge and policy beliefs. Are concussions being perceived as more costly than reality, which was our suspicion? And how does concussion knowledge affect reporting? Um, the survey methods, again, were basically the same. Would you report, self-report an unseen concussion with the scenario that I read earlier? We had them rated from one to nine again. The demographics, this time we had um, 1,994 responses, so a little lower than the prior year, but still plenty powerful. And our questions are what do cadets know and what false beliefs might drive this low intent to report, okay? Um, as a sort of sanity check, the overall um, ACD or the anticipated self-report remained high. We had a median of seven, a mode of seven, and an average of over six again. So that's good, keeping things in context. But what's really interesting is when we got to the myth part of this, we asked cadets, is there a concussion rule? And the question was worded this way. After a certain number of diagnosed concussions, Air Force policy requires removal of my pilot qualification. Is that true or false? 86% of cadets falsely believed that this was the case. Okay, so this is a really common myth. On top of that, that myth significantly predicted anticipated concussion disclosure. So that is, if you believe this myth that a certain number of concussions would automatically disqualify you from becoming a pilot, then it meant that you were less like, you were going to, uh, less likely to want to self-report. Your self-report intent was lower. And the funner part comes when we ask them, how many concussions is too many? Colloquially, this was known as the two concussion rule. Um, if you got two concussions, you couldn't fly anymore. Um, this rule does not exist, which is the funny part of this, but, but it is widely believed throughout the Air Force because this is something that people did not really want to talk about. We asked them how many concussions is too many, and the mean is about three, but you can see there's quite a range of what people think is the, the number of concussions that knocks you out of being a pilot. And so more or less, we consider this, um, this sort of heuristic where if you know a person who got to what we call pilot qualification or a pilot slot and they had three concussions, then the number that knocks you out is four. And if you know someone who had five concussions in flu, then the number is probably six. Um, everybody believes that there's this number, but nobody can agree on what it is. And so, and so we, um, we've tried to follow up on 
exactly what this could be. Um, what, what are these other beliefs and myth? And when we break it down, there are different, um, there are different groups that believe this more than others. Um, when we talk about sex, females are less likely to believe this. Um, underclassmen, first years, freshmen are more likely to believe this. What's interesting is that NCAA athletes are less likely to believe this. So are contact sport athletes, except for football. Um, people who have been previously concussed are less likely to believe this. Um, pilot, pilot career, pilot qualified, and NCAA training had no st statistically significant difference on these groups. And so what's interesting, if you look at athletes and sports and previously concussed, it's sort of like the people who know more are less likely to believe this myth. And so we felt like part of what we needed to do was get a little bit more information out there. But it's really interesting that our freshmen believe this. And one of the interesting things is, you know, when we were doing this survey, we're handing it out during freshman uh, basic training concussion baseline. So they've only been at the Air Force Academy for maybe eight, 10 days. And we got this one, uh, this one survey back that I wanted to read out, which is this, this person who's a freshman, so they've only been there for 10 days, writes, I want to say that USAFA makes it next to impossible to treat concussions. Since the, the doctors hand out PQ disqual, that's pilot disqualifications, like candy. I'm not risking it. Okay, so this cadet says this. Um, it's amazing to me because he's only, the, the two funny things about this are one, he's only been there for 10 days and he really profoundly believes this myth. The other funny thing is we don't have a free response part of our survey. He just took it upon himself to just write this on the margins. And so this is the kind of depth of belief of this myth that makes it really interesting to us and, and really important to address. So to sort of sum up our results summary, we've got this self-willingness re remains overall high, but we've got these false concussion myths that predict willingness to self-report that are also high. Um, I didn't present this data, but the pilot acculturation that shows a lower willingness to self-report, it replicated again pretty strongly. And so um, we've got that last bit of anecdotal evidence that really puts a little bit of color into the uh, story here. And so one of the other things is we, when we present this at our Mind Matters concussion huddles with the other NCAA groups, you know, we present this one comment and it really colors in the outlines, but we don't really uh, have expertise in this qualitative uh, data collection. So we teamed up with the University of Georgia um, graduate student, doctoral candidate, Michelle Weber is the top photo. She sort of headed up this project where she said, why don't you bring me out there and I'll do a qualitative structured interview with cadets and we'll see what people with and without concussion history think. Um, her PI is Dr. Julianne Schmidt. Um, she is one of the only folks who is a PI, both of a Mind Matters and a CARE group, and she's at the University of Georgia. And so what we found in a qualitative structured interview format, replicated and colored in some of the data that we see here quantitatively. Perceived costs were most commonly cited reasons for not reporting. Um, they didn't want to lose their pilot qualification. They didn't want to get kicked out of the Air Force Academy. Uh, they didn't want to miss senior year uh, sporting events. And on top of that, another thing that we saw was this attempted self-management of concussions. Like I'm gonna hide these symptoms for a couple days and if it stays bad, then maybe I'll report then. And we thought that self-report um, management is a dangerous thing that we really wanted to tackle. And so we sort of have turned this, this is sort of everything before now is a little bit of diagnosis. And, and now we sort of tried to turn this into interventions. And so the three perceived costs that I just talked about are the, the, the main things we wanted to attack, attack. Pilots worries about their careers, Athletes worries about missing sport time. And all cadets, <laughs> there was a figure that I did not show, which was um, reporting concussions is a hassle. And that had a T value of 10 with a P of 0. 0.00001. And so cadets, while they get free walk-in um, healthcare at our cadet clinic, it still takes up a lot of time. They have seven classes per semester. So anything that takes them out of their structured day, they don't like. And so we, these are the main perceived costs we feel like we had to affect to get better self-reporting and improve clinical care. 
So the things that we did this was we tested a couple classroom interventions, and then we employed one during basic cadet training as well. Um, I hope everybody's still with me here. Yes? Okay, thank you. Um, so the first intervention we did was, was basically in our behavioral sciences version of an intro psych class. What makes things really nice about trying to do interventions at the Air Force Academy is that cadets are not really, um, their schedule is given to them. Uh, they choose their classes, but they don't choose when their classes are. So we essentially have pre-randomized classes that if you're doing an intervention, um, it makes it easy to test between different classrooms. And so with pre-randomized uh, assortment of cadets, you don't have to worry about afternoon classes being systematically different than morning ones, for example. So what did we find in our interest setting, interest like setting? Um, we did a lecture on the biology of concussions for every single section of the intro psych class here. Um, we had about 15 sections of about 30 kids, I believe. Um, so I, I did all of the um, Lieutenant Commander Johnson, who is my co-PI on my matters, he did all of the lecture on the biology of concussions. I did all of the neuroanatomy lecture. And for, for um, and then we showed physical human brains and showed the brain parts to all cadets. Randomly, we had an experimental five-minute talk by an Air Force con on Air Force concussion policy and pilot medicals by an Air Force Academy physician. So one group received this and the other just had extra time to look at the human brains and the anatomy. Um, this was given by Dr. Ruth German. She's a Lieutenant Colonel, but also an Air Force Academy graduate. She's the flight surgeon who is the person who qualifies them or disqualifies them from becoming a pilot. And she is, is friendly, uh, knowledgeable authority, but most importantly, she's the one who can tell them straight from sort of the horse's mouth it is very rare to be, to be disqualified from becoming a pilot because of having a concussion. And she says, this has happened only maybe four or five times in my seven years at the Air Force Academy. She directly tells this to cadets. And so if we look what happens with this intro to psych intervention, we have the same measure, anticipated concussion disclosure. The people who got the normal uh, control, what happens during a concussion and sort of um, neuroanatomy the people who got the experimental condition got those same measures that would be sort of typical of concussion education. And on the right, they additionally got this Air Force policy talk from the flight surgeon. And they were much more likely to be willing to self-report after the fact. We did a similar measure in our junior year leadership class, the same exact talk from Dr. German, but because this is integrated into a leadership class, this time we asked cadets, to develop an outreach method as a group for how you would get this information out in the cadet wing, uh, which is what we call a sort of cadet student body. The experimental variable here was we either gave them our same survey before or after they got this lesson. And for those who got it before is the control group, the experimental group got it after. And you can see once again, this talk that addresses here's the reality of a pilot slot and how you're not likely to lose your pilot qualifications just because of um, one short concussion. Uh, it made a big difference. It's just a five minute talk, but it addresses directly their perceived costs. And so finally, our last one was, we have um, basic cadet training every summer for incoming freshmen. And that is, you go out in the woods and you have to do all the obstacle courses and things that you've seen before in, um, in all sorts of military contexts. And I want to spe specifically call out, we have um, Dr. John Jackson here, Dr. Joel Robb, we have um, Bonnie Anderson, ATC, and we have Dr. Wyrith. They are our core clinical uh, concussion team. And they, um, the two middle ones, uh, Dr. Robb and uh, Bonnie Anderson, who is our ATC, they are paid for by our care grant. And so they are part of um, why we can deliver a high level of concussion care. And so this outreach team, um, instead of giving our survey during basic training, we use that time to teach cadets about their susceptibility to concussions first. Um, from the care data, we found out that because of things like basic cadet training and lack of sleep and more intense military training, 
our cadets who are first years are much more susceptible to concussions than, um, than actually all other three classes combined. And so when you tell cadets that, that gets their attention, this is something I need to be aware of. We told them what the signs and symptoms were of concussions. And then we also told them about how there were worsened outcomes with late reporting. We we're really concerned about the self-management of concussion. And so we wanted to say that, look, if you report late, um, according to Askin et al's data, you're likely to have a longer concussion recovery. And on top of that, you're, you're gonna make it more likely that you have an orthopedic injury. Okay, so those are, rather than telling them um, down the line, you could be hurt by this, you might not be as uh, healthy when you're 55. We tell them that right now, this is gonna cost you your, immediately, your immediate performance and health. And we think that's a, a little bit more effective and immediate way to get them to care about this. And so our return to play data, we're sort of um, non-committal based on this. Um, we only got these data about four days ago and still our self-report part of it is missing. What you can see is that there is a non-significant effect of this year's versus last year's basic cadet training. Um, there are, the median number of days it takes to recover is 13 and a half versus 16. The mean is 16.1 versus 17. So it got a little bit lower, but this, this difference is non-significant for now. So um, we need to look at this a little bit more carefully. The thing that's positive, I would say, is that we had dramatically less late reporting, which is good because we know that from our own data, late reporting is, um, is sort of associated with longer recoveries. And so to show you that data from, from our clinic, I want to again highlight um, Joel Robb's input here. He is the sort of primary uh, person who keeps stats on all of our concussions. And, and one of the things that, you know, I've been harping on is the connection between self-report and clinical care. And so as part of our clinical intake interview, um, Joel has taken upon himself to add a sort of mini self-report uh, questionnaire type, uh, type intake to ask people why they're reporting and when they reported and how late it was. And, and what we see is that in our clinic here, we have about 591 people here. If you report immediately, your, your um, concussion is likely to be about 21 days. But the later you report, the, like, the more likely you are to have a longer concussion recovery. And if you get to four plus days, now you're almost doubling your expected return to play time. So this is where we think that self-management has a really negative, um, uh, negative effect on outcomes, right? You're trying to self-manage, you want to delay, and you perceive this as having no cost. But in reality, the longer you delay, the longer you're exacerbating your symptoms and extending your recovery. If we look at the same data, but in terms of a survival curve, you can see that folks in orange and um, blue over here they are immediate and one day reporters. And about 50% of those folks recover in about 16, 17 days. Whereas for the four day or later group, that 50% recovery is all the way out at like 27, okay? So again, this self-management has real clinical costs. And in particular, it costs athletes when we talk about how, to, how do you motivate athletes to report, telling them that they won't be healthy 10 years down the line is probably not going to do it. But telling them that if they report immediately, they have about a 15 day recovery. And if they wait three days or more, it's more like 30 plus days. That's a little bit more effective, we think. And so what we see again here is athletes have an advantage in recovery time, but the longer they delay that report, the more they sort of lose that advantage and regress to the mean. And so for us, what does this mean for interventions? Well, the, the tack that we've taken is directly addressing perceived costs. Um, okay. Um, whenever possible, we want to know what, what the direct cost to a person personally will be. Um, and we want to develop policies and outreaches that minimize these disclosure costs or their misperceptions. And we want to take a cult culture approach as well, which is they, this sometimes may cost you, but you should do it anyway. We reassessed all of these things this current fall, 
And what we've seen is that if we look at athlete status by class year, um, all of our measures have moved up and got significantly more positive towards self-reported concussion here. We no longer have any effect of athlete in terms of self-reporting. They're just as likely as typical cadets. Um, more interesting, for our pilots, you can see in 2015, they were very unlikely. For our non-pilot versus pilot interaction now, we see that senior year pilots who used to be all the way down here at four and a half are now all the way up at six for whether or not they would self-report. And on top of that, our myth belief has gone down uh, as well. Um, our, in 2016, we we're at 86%. Now we're at 65, but among the seniors where it really matters, we're at 60%. And so finally, I just wanna show, um, we have these senior cadets who work with me in research. And um, one of them had this idea of going to the anonymous um, Yodel social media website, which gives you an unvarnished and often um, not very savory view of what people think of things. And so she said, I, I think I might have a concussion. Should I report it? I'm worried about PQ, which is pilot qualification. And I don't know what would have been said five years ago, but now the first three responses are, report it, they don't affect pilot qualifications unless you've had like 20. Okay, that's not exactly true, but it's in the right direction, okay? Um, or, or if the concussion lasts more than eight weeks, go to the doctor and start getting treated now or else I promise you it will take far longer. And then the last one is you don't want to take finals with the concussion reported. And so this is exactly sort of straight out of the textbook of what we would want cadets to tell other cadets. And so we think that we've now really hit a slightly more positive tipping point in how people view concussion and concussion treatment. And since we're running behind, I'm just going to say um, again, thank you to the organizers for um, allowing me to present this data to you all. Um, I, I wish I could have met you all in person, but ChristopherDelar at gmail.com is my email address, Cognard on Twitter. Um, thanks again for, uh, for everything. I appreciate it a lot. We have time for one question from the audience, if anyone would like to ask yeah, a question. Anyone, we're about to break for Take lunch, your question. I, if anyone has a question for Dr. Delora before he signs off. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Deloro, right, for, so joining, much for us. joining us. Hey, okay. thank you all. Much appreciated.